works. Yeah. So hi everyone that is here. Um, we have Martha here from Facultad de Economia. I'm sorry if I <laughs> don't pronounce okay. that very well. <laughs> Uh, she's going to be here talking to us about the effectiveness of economic policies to promote growth. And we've got a case study in Mexico. Yes. should be very interesting. Uh, take the stage. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, wait, uh, actually, no, sorry, yeah. one second. Uh, remember everyone to put your questions in the Q&A and um, we can answer those at the end. And uh, Martha, remember to say next slide every time. Because we've okay, got... yeah, <laughs> perfect. Thank you. I will. Okay. Well, hello to everyone. Um, my name is Martha. Um, I will presenting a bit of about my research. So currently, I've been working on uh, the Mexico case because I was interested in looking at why the policies that the government has been implementing are not working to promote growth, are not being successful. So I was uh, interested in applying a different approach. So complexity looked uh, the, the perfect approach to, to, to use. So let me go to uh, the introduction slide. Uh, this is the third slide. And here I have a sort of a point. So we just heard about uh, Professor Kierman uh, presentation about complexity, complexity in economics. So we are going to um, depart from the fact that the economy is a complex system and we can represent this complex system as a network. So uh, studying this network, the structure of this network will uh, give us additional information about uh, for example, the interaction of all these different sectors that are producing products and that are interacting in the economy. And that would give us some clues about uh, why some of these sectors are not uh, successful in promoting growth. So I'll, I'll be more specific later on. So economies are complex systems, they can be represented as networks, and this opens up a wide range of tools and methods that we can apply for our analysis that go a bit beyond what uh, economists are used to. Uh, also allowed us to provide some um, visualizations. Uh, I learned no, that for policy making process, for policy makers, visualizations are important. So for us as researchers, it's okay to give our analysis and some, you know, some measurements and calculations, but then the policymaker would be like, okay, so what should I do with that? So if we can provide also some visualizations that would make it easier for them to understand how can we go from our research to the application of our results in the policy making process, well, that's a great help. So next slide is our, the motivation for this research. Actually, what I'm including in this presentation is part of a research project, which is uh, pretty pretty wide, no? uh, but uh, it's trying to answer at least one or two questions. Uh, let me talk about the motivation first and then talk about the questions. So the motivation is uh, Mexico has implemented an export-driven growth model. What it means is that it has focused, the government has focused on uh, promoting some export sectors in the hopes that they will promote growth, promote employment, promote a, a, a lot of uh, benef benefits for Mexico. Uh, but, however, no, these exporter sectors have not contributed to economic growth as they were expected to. So we can say that this model or this policy that the government has been implementing for the last 30 years, it has not been successful. No? There's, some, there's some issues that are not allowing these export sectors to have the performance and the effect on the macroeconomy that uh, the government was hoping to. 
So uh, the literature on tackling these problems has focused on the disarticulation of these exporter sectors in the economy and has uh, addressed this problem mainly from the input-output analysis perspective. Uh, of course, this is going to be uh, linked or related to the analysis we're going to do because in our research we have a network analysis. A network analysis, you'll see further on, is really closely related to input-output analysis. But m one of my um, points I'm making is that once we are assuming that the economy is a complex system and that we can represent the economy as a network, we can apply network analysis and complement all this type of analysis from the input-output perspective and uh, go deeper into the explanation why these sectors are disarticulated from the rest of the economy. Yeah. So really, uh, I'm going to talk a bit more about this later, but this is really more like how these sectors are linked in this network. How are they connected in this network? And not only are they locally connected, but globally connected in the network. So that will make uh, a difference. OK. So uh, the objective, let's say, that uh, I had with this research that we could also make it as, a, as a research question was mainly two. So investigate the role of these uh, exporter sectors uh, in this Mexican production network and uh, move forward in explaining their poor contribution to growth. Why this strategy that the government implemented has not been successful? No? Maybe if we can find the, the role that these sectors have in the network or the relation that these sectors have with the rest of the economy, we can find some clues that would give uh, relevant information about this strategy, this type of policy. And then uh, this will help us also to improve our understanding about the relation that there is between these properties of the network and some of the macroeconomic barriers value added, uh, global exports, etc. So uh, to um, address these two points, I use input output data. That's why I told you uh, this network analysis is closely linked to input and output. So I just input and output data, but I have two sources of data because I am going to study this Mexican economy, this network from two scales of analysis. So this is a bit uh, problematic because both scales are uh, using data uh, with two different uh, classification of sectors. So that's problematic when trying to compare. But <laughs> but I will argue that we can still draw some conclusions about these exporter sectors in the economy because mainly the exporter sectors in the economy are from the manufacturing industry. Uh, so the manufacturing industry belongs to one classification and these different exporter sectors will belong to another type of uh, classification, but we can uh, relate them to some, to some extent. No? So two sets of data. One uh, comes from uh, the INEGI, which is the, the official no, uh, data provider for Mexico. And we, at least with this classification of sectors, we have two years, 2008-2012. These are symmetric domestic tables for, for uh, 259 sectors, and they are in a million Mexican pesos. Yeah? And then the other scale of analysis will come from input output tables from the WIOT, which is the World Input Output Database. And this is important because it has uh, one, one table for the whole North American region. So, uh, this is important for me because export sectors are mainly exporting to North American region, to the U.S. and Canada. So if I can also track down the role or the relation that these sectors have 
in that network, which is Mexico and the rest of the countries in the North American region, that would also give me some clues about why this export strategy is not working for Mexico. Okay, so that is the database. Now I have uh, sort of uh, the methods that I'm using. Uh, I divided in three. Oh, I've been forgetting to, I'm sorry, I've been forgetting to say next slide. Oh, no, don't worry. <laughs> sorry. We, um, the, the slides are working perfectly anyway. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, sorry for the interruption. No, it's so, fine. Um, <laughs> we're going to the method section. Next slide. And uh, I have divided this in three. So the first one will be about how to represent the economy as a network using input output data. The second one will be um, how to sort of measure type of aggregate effect and diffusion. We'll, I'll explain it later, but this aggregate effect is closely related to some measures of input output analysis. But the diffusion measure is not. It's uh, giving more information, more detailed information. So it's important to be able to compare both and complement the information about how these sectors are affecting the economy. No? I'll explain it later. And at the end, I have this network spreading model, which I use uh, to sort of analyze how these export sectors in Mexico could be affecting positively or negatively the entire North American region input output uh, network. No? This is for the last scale of analysis. So in the next slide, <laughs> I talk about uh, specifically, once I have the network, what I want to find. So I said, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on finding or on computing the properties of this network and the role or uh, the position, let's say, that these exporter sectors have in the network. For that, I use well some input output measures that are closely related to uh, degrees in in the in the networks. The the measure measure of diffusion that I talked about, but um, centralities in the network. How central are these nodes in the network? And not just any centrality, but global centrality. That is, how embedded are these, these sectors in the network due to its uh, direct and indirect connections uh, with the rest of the system? No? Not, only, not only direct links or uh, locally uh, interconnectivity, but globally in the whole network. And lastly, uh, the spreading of shocks that I talked about. Uh, but just uh, one note, I'm using like everything I'm, I'm doing it in Python. And I'm using at least these three libraries for just uh, to, to compute everything. And you can find some of these uh, codes uh, on the Open Science Framework, and you know, they're they're split in different projects. But if you just uh, navigate on the Open Science Framework under my name, you'll you'll find everything. If you're interesting. On the next slide, uh, I talk about specifically about the production network. So how we go from the input output tables to the network. So first, let me talk about a bit about the input output model. So the input output model. I don't know if everyone knows it, but it's just, it gives us how total production can be calculated from intermediate demands plus a final demands of sectors in the economy. So once we have that, I just take the intermediate demands table, which is uh, all the supply and demand of inputs between the tables. This is the square matrix that I talked about. And uh, this will, allow me to represent the economy as a weighted directed network. Here it is, the next slide, it has a picture. Uh, I hope it's easy to understand. We have the input output table. With Here is just an example with five sectors. And then I go to the network. And the network is clearly directed, is weighted. And uh, each of the cells that I have in the table 
will become this weight of the links, okay? And the size of the nodes, which are these circles here, are, um, are going to be measured as their production, total production. Okay, so now, now that we have the network, we can start measuring stuff, no? So the first thing I'm gonna measure is how we get effect, which is actually equivalent to the um, output multiplier in input output analysis. It's just how, uh, how much production is needed to compensate a change in final demand of a sector. So, and I measure that for every sector in the economy and then I compare, no? I, I make a, a sort of a ranking and see. Um, this is going to give me a measure of an aggregate effect on the economy. So, um, in the entire economy, how much one sector is affecting this economy? And I, I want to find, are these export sectors having a high aggregate effect or a low aggregate effect? No, This is what I want to find. And actually, since the policy is not being successful, I, I, I just am expecting to find that these exporter sectors are having a low aggregate effect in the, in the production because this is an effect on production. So, well, I'm, I'm expecting to find in that. Now we go a bit more about uh, more individual effects, which is, is diff diffusion. So how this aggregate effect is being diffused no, I, just, I don't want to see the entire thing, but I want to see how it is diffused among uh, different sectors. And this is giving me a sense of uh, concentration, no? concentration or diffusion. So if I have a, an exporter sector that is diffusing this effect to a wide range of other different sectors, then I can say, well, maybe the aggregate effect is not as high, but it has a good diffusion. So it's reaching a wide set of other sectors. So it, the, the potential impact of this uh, could, could compensate, no? But on the other hand, if I found that these exporter sectors are concentrating the effect on itself or just a few other sectors, then the effect that they can have on the economy, you know? So uh, that would also give me a clue on why these sectors are not having uh, uh, the impact that we're expecting to. Okay, and this uh, measure of diffusion is just, uh, well, you're, I'm just using uh, some entries of the of the NTF matrix that I uh, told you how to compute uh, earlier on, on on the slides about the input output model. Uh, I'm not going to go to the specifics of the of the formula, but uh, it's based on the idea of the this Herfindahl concentration index, which is giving me the opposite of concentration. Okay, so finally, let me just go ahead and speak about the spring of the shock. One of the main advantages of being able to represent the economy as a network is that we can apply uh, these spreading models that uh, have happen in networks. So this is a spring of a shock in the network, in the input output network or the production network, I use that interchangeably, uh, come from, uh, here I put some uh, reference, but they come from really uh, models of a uh, spring of shocks in physics. So it, it's similar to, to the type of shocks that we can observe on power grids. And also it's a type of, uh, the type of, uh, spring of shocks that we can observe when in econophysics uh, people have used it to see how crises spread from one one country to another. So at the end I provide some references but uh, it's really this uh, the we are inspiring that type of model. So here I'm just saying uh, I want to observe in the network if I introduce a type of shock that is changing the supply and demand of inputs, what is happening in the network and um, which sector are impacting or having an effect on the rest of the economy. So I also provide a ranking. And also, as I've been uh, doing it for the 
other measures. I want to see if exporter sectors are, are the ones that are affecting more other sectors or less or what is happening with these uh, exporter sectors. No? Um, this model, this spring of a shock model, I apply it in the NAFTA region network, not only in Mexico, but this is for the higher scale network that I talked to you about with the other uh, input output data. So I want to see if I shock one of these sectors in the manufacturing industry in Mexico, what's the effect in the regional economy? No? Okay. So here, well, I, here in the next slide, I talk about a bit of what I, I'm focusing on. No? I want to see how many sectors and which sectors in particular are being affected. So what happens if I shock the manufacturing industry versus if I shock the agricultural industry? No. Why? Because traditionally Mexico has been exporting manufacturing, not agriculture. So I want to see those differences. Okay, so this is uh, all from the methods section. Let me go to the results because time is running out. So for the results, I have uh, different sets of results. Uh, as I said, uh, I was focusing on providing rankings and see the position of the role of these exporter sectors and differences between, uh, for example, maybe the exporter sectors uh, were producing a lot but the effects of these different types of shocks in these sectors were very limited. So maybe that production would stay within those exporter sectors and wouldn't spread or have, have spillovers to the rest of the economy. And that's why their effects on production in the long run are not being successful. So here I have some uh, measures. These are just the strongest connections between pair of sectors. I just wanted to see uh, if in these strongest connections, in this input output, no, uh, uh, supply and demand of inputs, what, what was happening? If I could find some of these exporter sectors in, in, in this type of measures, what I see is, uh, <laughs> is oil, no? This is no surprise. I, all I have is oil, 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 and some uh, metallic minerals extraction. But if you see uh, most of these uh, in, in sectors that have important connections are just extractive, no? They are not manufacturing. They are not, uh, we know Mexico exports oil, but uh, it's still, uh, it doesn't, it's not really an intermediate good that we can, um, see it's really connected with the rest of the economy, no? in Mexico at least. Uh, here I have other types of rankings in the following slide, uh, which are top ranked sectors according to macroeconomic variables. So I wanted to see, as I told you, if the biggest in, uh, sectors in terms of connect, uh, production are also the ones that have the highest exports or the highest value added. And well, we can see that not exactly, no? And also we can see that at the top of these rankings, there are sectors that are not manufacturing sectors. So we have trade, we have renting of houses, and again, we have oil, no? The only one that uh, appears in exports, no? that it's important is cars and trucks fabrication. But it doesn't have the highest production. It doesn't have the highest value added. So at the macro level, there are some clues, but still there's nothing no, definitive. So now we go to the other measures, the, the, the network measures and the diffusion measures to see if they give some clues about why these sectors are, are having these problems to promote growth for Mexico. So according to aggregate effect and diffusion, we, I, I put here in this slide, the, um, the sectors that for Mexico are having the highest aggregate effect and the best diffusion of this effect to the rest of the economy. So th this would be a desirable uh, characteristic for the economy, right? 
And what we can see is that the sectors that have this desirable characteristic <laughs> are not manufacturing industries, are not the export industries. So this is a big clue uh, why the, the export sectors are not being successful, no? And this, this like regular air transport, international extraterritorial organisms, no? Uh, these are, are, are sectors that um, potentially don't have a strong interconnections with the rest of the economy in terms of a, a production chains, no? Uh, now for the only diffusion, I wanted to make just a quick uh, uh, exercise, and this is mainly for the visualization of it. Because remember at the beginning of the talk, I talked to you about, it's also very important to be able to transmit this type of analysis to the policy makers, because this is an analysis about the successfulness of the policy. So this type of visualization, there are uh, six networks in our uh, slide, are showing these differences in the diffusion of the effects of uh, uh, certain types of shocks of some sectors. Uh, here I'm just at the top, let the first row, let's say, is giving examples about the sectors that have the best diffusion. And these are, uh, as I told you, regular air transport and international and extraterritorial organisms. The middle row are sectors that are having well, some middle, no, some mean uh, diffusion, and these are dairy products and fruits and nuts. So, no, none of them are export sectors on the manufacturing industry. And the um, the lowest row with the pictures are E and F. Um, they show sectors that typically just concentrate the whole effect on themselves. So they have really zero spillovers on the rest of the economy. And these are uh, artists, writers, and homes with domestic workers. No? So this is just one type of visualization and we can do this for every sector. And we can observe particular cases to uh, try to explain our strategy, our analysis to the policy makers. The next slide are diffusion and centralities. As I told you, it's important to be able to say something about the centralities of these sectors in the economy. So at the macro level, no, this is for every sector for two years. We see there is a close relationship between uh, the centrality, this is hope scores, this is one type of centrality uh, related to the out connections of the sectors and then the measure of diffusion I show you. So this close relationship is telling us that for those sectors that have good diffusion, are, this is, uh, we could argue that this is because they are really uh, highly central in the network. And we saw earlier on that these uh, sectors with good diffusion are not the export sectors, are not the sectors that are exporting the most. So uh, this is another relation to these properties of the network. So uh, let me go faster <laughs> because I'm running out of time. In the next slide, I just want to give you some another type of visualization that we can use and provide to policymakers. These are correlation matrices, and these are telling us uh, if we look at them from no from from the outside, we can just see uh, if there is some close relationship between these variables. So the rows are the same as the columns. These are experiment correlation coefficients. And we have in order, so the first row at the top is production, then we have value added, exports, aggregate effect, diffusion, and the two centralities that I talked about. So we can see if there is any pairwise relationship between these variables that are macroeconomic variables and some uh, network properties, no? And uh, we can we want to see if there is some type of relationship and if this relationship changes through time because on the left side of the of the slide we have the the matrix for 2008. On the other side we have the matrix for 2012. And uh, well, both matrices are pretty much similar. And uh, obviously this pink, no, this uh, 
bright pink color is because uh, the correlation between itself, it's one, so that's why it's brighter. Uh, but some interesting cases are these purples, no? This would be, uh, for example, exports, no? And authorities, uh, authority centrality, or this would be production and authority centrality. These are some, no? What I wanted to see if there is some relationship, no? At the aggregate between, for example, exporters and diffusion, or exporters and some centralities, but we can see that no, no. At the macro level, there is no relationship between the sectors that are exporting the most and the sectors that are generating the highest value added, or the sectors that are exporting the most and the sectors that have the best diffusion. No? There is no relation. Okay. Finally, uh, with the results for the spring of a shock on manufacturing in the NAFTA production network, we saw, I'm going to be really uh, fast on this type of results. Uh, we only observed something. So the pattern of sectors that were affected when this manufacturing sector was shocked, we saw that uh, this pattern for the USA was very similar to uh, the NAFTA region, no? So really the USA production network is dominating the region and this is no surprise. But what is a surprise is that Mexico, no? When the manufacturing sector in Mexico was being uh, shocked, the pattern that it uh, showed is very different from this NAFTA region, from the US region, from the US uh, network. Uh, it's very limited, it's very concentrated, it's not spreading the shock to a wide part of the economy. And moreover, the sectors that are being affected in these waves of shocks are very different from the US and the NAFTA production network waves. No, So there's clear, clearly a difference um, when in, in the capability of this manufacturing sector to affect the rest of other sectors. I'm gonna go fast. I'm gonna go directly to discussion and conclusions because I'm running out of time. Just uh, for me, it's interesting to see uh, all this type of analysis between input output aggregate uh, macroeconomic variables, diffusion, pro uh, network properties really gave us additional information about why these export sectors are not being able to uh, promote growth, which was the objective of the policy for Mexico. So there are uh, as the input output literature has been reporting, they are disarticulated from the rest of the economy. They have low centralities, they don't have good diffusion, they don't generate value added. No? So, uh, of course, in the long run, these sectors, I'm, go I'm only going to affect themselves. So the effects they can provide for the rest of the economy are very limited. And uh, the other sectors that do have these desirable characteristics are sectors that also are not, um, uh, ironically, are not being promoted by the government, are not being stimulated, are not being, no? So these are uh, small, relatively small sectors and uh, that are not connected with the manufacturing sector. Okay. So uh, I'm just gonna go directly to conclusions. <laughs> so uh, Mexico's export driven model has not been successful. Why? Because it is aiming at stimulating sectors that do not have these high linkages with the rest of the economy. So really their position in the network is uh, it's not been central. And those do not have good diffusion, don't generate high aggregate effects, do not spread the shocks to the rest of the economy. The sectors that do, as I said, are services or extractive sectors that are not connected to the production of intermediate goods. So, uh, and that are not being promoted. No? So really, uh, Mexico has two, two choices, no? I would say, two options. Either it starts to build on these linkages for the manufacturing industry 
and to really construct the whole production chain or redirect their policy and start promoting a different kind of sectors, no? like the ones we found here with desirable characteristics. Which one is best? Which one is easier? That's a really tough question to answer. Uh, and mainly uh, since these are uh, objects of policy making, uh, they depend on the government and they depend on who is in charge in the government at the time. So, uh, no, but at least uh, we have some interesting results. Um, and I think I will leave it here to, to hear some of your questions. Here are some references that uh, I mentioned on the slides and that could be interesting for you. And uh, uh, as I said, you can go to the Open Science Framework and search for the different projects I have under my name. And most of them are related to this type of analysis and making. Something interesting is that even though right now I'm focused on Mexico, you can focus this type of analysis to any country, no? to try to evaluate the effectiveness of uh, different types of policies for any country, because what we're studying is the properties of the system. So it doesn't matter if these properties are this or that, we just wanna find the relationship between, between the properties of that system to you know, the measures of the policies that, that their government are making or taking. So uh, this could be implemented for a, any country, any system. And I, I think I'll, I'll finish here and I'll, I'll hear you if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Martha. That was, um, that was brilliant. I really like that. Um, Anyone, if anyone's got any questions, be sure to put them in the chat. But I've got, <laughs> I'd like to uh, ask a couple of my own actually. Do you ever get to, do you ever get to present this research to the Mexican government, or do they have uh, economists working for them that present complex uh, stuff like this? Uh, no, not that I know of. No, this is really sad. Uh, here in Mexico, at the university I'm working at, they have we have a, a complexity institute, let's say, no, el Instituto de, de, de Ciencias de la Complejidad, and this this institute has been working really closely with some parts of the government, but not on a. This is sadness. This is really sad because they've been working on health issues, like uh, some sickness issues. They have been working on um, bio biology and uh, environment and climate change and stuff like that, but really on economics, uh, we don't have a, a, a real audience in the, in the government right now. Um, we it's, just hope that by, yeah, by publishing yeah. this work, some, someone will read it. <laughs> no? Yeah, I hope so. Um, it's good that you, that the um the institute gets some attention from the government though for um for some things at least um yeah uh let's see if there are any questions uh i've got another one um i'm sorry oh, there yeah, is sure. a question in the chat but not in the q a oh wait was that oh yeah okay i'll read this uh can you see that on the right hand side martha uh let me see it's in the chat, not the Q and A. Oh, okay, in the chat. Uh, who's who's chat? Curtis. Oh, yeah, so, okay. Great findings makes a lot of sense. Consist. Yeah, I can read it. Uh, considering the interconnectedness, yes. Do you think your kind of analysis has prospect to affect policy at a more local level, or is it really only suited for the national level? Uh, is economic policy determined in Mexico? Is it by the president or on federal agencies? Okay, so the first question about uh, more of the local level or federal level. I think this type of analysis, since is based on input output data, and input output data, at least in Mexico, are really treated as macro data, not uh, at the, and we don't have data for. Um, I think we have data for uh, some uh, re uh, like geographical regions, but not at the really local level. So for a local government to see this type of analysis 
uh, I think for them it will be really hard to to understand how they can apply it for their government. It doesn't mean it it, it wouldn't work because in Mexico we really have an organization of activities. No, it, it's still truth that in the north we have some industries and in the south we have more agricultural industries and the extractive sector like for oil and, and gas and stuff it's really in the in the gulf coast uh it's still i don't i don't i don't think it would work for the local government i think this is more intended for federal government type of uh um, to counseling or i don't know advising no and the other question about who is determining the economic policy in mexico so here we have a ministry it's called uh la secretaria de economía no the, the the economic secretary or i don't know how we would translate that the department of economics and and that together with other agencies of the federal government are determined these uh, policies so uh, it's not really like the president it's not the legislature it's really these uh ministers or uh, secretaries that are determining the type of policy we're following so for example this economic secretary is determining most of these uh policies related to the new NAFTA agreement. No, it's not called NAFTA now, but it's called something similar. And that is determining, of course, this export driven, driven growth model. No, uh, but yeah, so it's more like the, the, the agencies of the federal government that are determining this policy. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have another question from Daniel as well. If you can read that. Yeah. Do you think the creation of the Pacific Alliance might create another big trading block where shocks could potentially affect the Mexican economy just as much? Yeah, I think so. Uh, really, the role that Mexico has with the U.S., like it's, it's true that Mexico depends highly on the export that is selling to, 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 to the U.S., so the role that China and other Asian countries ha have been playing on this trade, it's really affecting Mexico. So Mexico is really sensible, susceptible to these changes in trade. And of course, this type of alliance will affect Mexico uh, in those terms. It would be different, it would be difficult to measure because we need these tables and under the same categories or classifications and we need no, we need that sort of type of uh data but uh i would say yes no it would affect mexico in this type of analysis hmm. yeah okay um, i've got one last question before we go off to the cafe yeah um how do you see yeah. this kind of research uh, i don't know how can it be implemented into an undergraduate degree because this is it's it's complex research how can it how can it be used yeah. to change an undergrad degree yeah i think on my experience you need uh different levels no yeah. first you need to learn about these input output tables because they're not easy to understand it took me a while they are based on this input output model and these assumptions and you have all this sort of information about these input output tables that is really relevant to understand before using those type of tables to construct networks. No? So first you need to understand. So what I would advise and actually I have uh, talked about this with my department at the UNAM is to teach serious courses about input output tables because this is really useful analysis what you can draw from the input output tables so once you have that on the undergrad you can using these um, network analysis courses along with algebra linear algebra courses and also that is something i've been talking about with my department so you have input output you have linear algebra and then you have networks. It's really linked together. And those type of uh, courses will give you know, the, the background, the, the basic background that students require 
to do something else more elaborate elaborate on on the graduate studies no because on the like for me for example that i didn't have that on my undergrad studies i had to do it on my own before starting my phd no mm -hmm. i had to start learning about the simple output tables the simple output analysis and then i started taking really seriously about uh, impu uh network analysis on my own so if you have like even though if it's basic or introductory courses in the undergrad it will help a lot for students that are interested in these topics to go further beyond no in their graduate studies mm. Mm. yeah because at rethink economics that's definitely what we fight for you know having um <laughs> Yeah. having courses on everything and i think complexity economics is it would be a really valuable part of an undergraduate degree it's a shame that it isn't in lots of places yeah um yeah i think we can call it an end there it's been terrific talking to you 